This is the ERP Advisor. Today's episode, The Science of Proper Data Hygiene. Sean Wendell is our speaker for today. Sean is the founder and managing principal of ERP Advisors Group based in Denver, Colorado. On today's call, Sean will discuss the science behind proper data hygiene and the best way to approach a data migration project. Sean, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, you bet, Julia. It's yeah. always a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> we appreciate it. So um, I guess we can just get started here. Uh, for those who might not be familiar with our topic, what is data hygiene exactly? So data hygiene is when you go to the dentist and they start to, no, just kidding. That's a, that's a different kind of hygiene. <laughs> no, this is really about the um, enterprise data that you have throughout your company. So it could be things like contacts, customers, all kinds of different things, vendors, your invoices. If you think about an organization, a nonprofit or profit, there's all this information, this data about the business. But how do we not only keep it clean, but keep it maintained and keep it accurate? So it's really kind of data hygiene. You can think of it as a process for ensuring the cleanliness of the data. So pretty straightforward. Um, you know, you really want to look at ways to keep things like error free in terms of how you're tracking information. And if you can think about even like the cost of not having clean data or keeping a good data hygiene program in place, that's where it gets really interesting. We'll probably talk about that more a little bit later, but but that's yeah. a pretty good definition to work with. Okay, great. That's a great start. So what are some of the most common errors that we should watch out for? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing, right? Because you spend all this money on enterprise software. So it could be anything from a fire department that has to track information about their patients and the people that they go see and help, all the way through to, um, it could be a distributor who's tracking information about their inventory, or even some crazy zany examples I'm trying to think about where we have a client that sells very zany clothes. And they have to keep track of the designs that they've made for maybe a Broncos player who's got a special outfit, or maybe there's other kind of interesting symbols and things that they put on their undergarments and that. So there's there's a lot of data that an enterprise has to really keep track of. And so if, if you think about the mistakes and the, the common areas to watch out for, one of the things is you just don't have the right data elements, right? Where there's really important information that isn't being tracked. So we were at a business recently and um, as they're starting to grow and expand, they're an engineer to order manufacturer and the information that they have about their costing, it's actually pretty light. Like they don't have really specific information that goes into their projects because, well, in the past, it didn't matter as much. But now as they're getting bigger and the costs are starting to increase and there's more labor and variability in what they're building, they're realizing, wow, you know, we really need information about job costs that um, that we didn't have before. So that's a big one to look out for, too. Um, there can also be things like really badly defined values. So a great and super simple example is if you look at a company name. So almost any organization will have a name field, whether it's the company name or the donor's name or some kind of a name. Well, what goes into that name field? Is it the name of the full name of the company? So um, ABC Co dash LLC or comma LLC. Is it just ABC, ABC Co, whatever? There's all these different options that are kind of sitting out there. And without really good standards being set by the organization, you're really kind of up to the whims of usually salespeople. Because hmm. the salespeople are working with the customer that really at the beginning of the life cycle of a deal. And so they kind of put information fast, right? Because they need to just enter their information and get on to the next task. And so this kind of like badly defined values is something that, that we run into a lot where you get garbage in equals garbage out. So like we were just talking to another business uh, yesterday and, and we were talking about how they want to automate their invoicing. 
that starts all the way from, hey, let's get an order in up front and then let's just lights out is a common phrase that you'll hear. I just want to put in the order and whoop, I just, the invoice gets automatically emailed and taxes get automatically applied. But, but one of the people on the calls in the UK division was saying, but you know, oftentimes the salespeople don't get the right bill to information. They'll get the ship to, they'll figure out who to send the software to. It's a software vendor, mm -hmm. but they don't have the bill to information. And if you think about the salesperson, right, they're trying to, they're trying to sell the deal. They're trying to get onto the next one and they get a signature and they go on to the next deal. But one of the things that we, they have to enforce is to get the, who to send the invoice to up front. So you kind of see this like kind of combination of business process and data that the better the data is, is the better the process is kind of defined, the less errors you'll see on the data side too. So putting in better standards, you know, having a program around data hygiene where you're looking at these couple things can make a huge, huge difference. Wow. That's a lot to keep I track know, of, right? right? It's amazing. <laughs> you need an ERP for that. That's right. That's right. So here I have a statistic. Um, according to Forbes, poor data quality cost the US economy approximately 3.1 trillion annually. Well, Can you explain where that expense might come from? Yeah, it sounds a little bit like what? Like really? But but if you think about a really simple scenario where um, well, let's take that last one, the bill to information, okay? So the salesperson says, okay, here's the order. Here's what the customer wants. Here's the price. I, they want an extra discount. I went back to the manager. The manager approved it. I went back to the customer. The customer says, well, I actually want these other terms. And you're like, doo, 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 like the ball's going back and forth. And you're like, oh my gosh, okay, good. And I need a bill to information just to get the order closed. I'm going to put it in a boop, done, right? Like that's kind of the cycle that salespeople are paid to do. They want to get the deal closed fast. Right. They put in Joe Schmo as the, as the bill to. Maybe they ask the prospect, like, who do we send the bill to? Oh, you send it to Joe Schmo. Great, we'll put in Joe Schmo. And that's it, right? Then the order gets placed, the fulfillment starts, right? Then we send an invoice over to accounting and accounting looks at that field and says, okay, it's Joe Schmo. So then accounting says, fine, put in the invoice. They don't know, the invoice goes out. The payment terms, let's say, are 30 days. So, so now we have a, like really almost like a time machine starts like day one, day two, day 30. Accounting looks in and says, hmm, we haven't, we haven't gotten paid on this. What's going on? Um, you know, maybe I'll just go ahead and send another email out to Joe Schmo and just see what's happening here. The email goes out and it doesn't, nothing happens. Like it's not like there's a bounced email or anything like that. But it takes a couple days to see kind of, hmm, well, maybe I give them an extra couple of days to see if they respond or whatever, and they haven't responded. You know, meanwhile, the rest of the business is moving forward. The cost of capital is increasing. We're having to pay people, and this invoice is still not getting paid. So finally, the accounting person, after maybe another 30 days, because they're like dealing with a million things mm -hmm. where 60 days total, says, I better call this person and find out what's going on. Because, you know, it's very common in B2B where you don't get paid within a certain amount of time. So then they call and like there's nobody named Joe Schmo at the company, like at all. So they're like, what's going on here? So then the first person that they call is the salesperson. Right. This is 60 days ago. Right. The salesperson says, well, that's what my buyer said it was. We sell engineering software. And that's what the head of engineering told me to do was to send it to Joe Schmo. And the accounting person's like, um, okay, well, I'm going to call your customer and find out. I'm like, no, 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 no. Let me call the customer. The engineering person's or the, the software right. person's busy. So there's another couple days that go by. They finally loft over a call. It takes the person on the other side a couple days to get back to them. We're at like day 70 and I'm still not done. Right. right? They come back and say, oh, guess what? Joe Schmo doesn't work with us anymore. Now it's Jane Doe. And they're like, oh, OK. So the salesperson tells the accounting department, OK, go ahead and send it to Jane Doe. So then the accounting partner sends it over to Jane Doe. Jane Doe gets it. She puts it into the AP payables list and they don't do payables except on Fridays and it's a Monday. Right. Now we're at day 80, check gets cut. Let's say it's just checks right. and the check takes a week to get to us. We're at day 90. So if you think about the amount of cost that went into, like if, if the salesperson would have gotten it right up front, and don't get me wrong, I'm not throwing salespeople under the bus. But if they would have gotten that right, maybe it was another couple minutes or something, the cost would have been like a dollar, right? But then you think about 
all of the time that the accounting person put into tracking all of this this stuff that was based off of this wrong piece of data up front, right. not to mention the cost mm-hmm. to the overall company of not having that cash to be able to do something different with it. Like that $1 mistake, if it would have just been a dollar um, that went into it, is probably worth over $100, if not more. Right. I mean, that scenario is even more right. because an accounting person, fully loaded costs is maybe doing 50 bucks right. an hour, maybe even more. Right. So this person's spending five, six, 10 hours on follow-up. So that's cost there, much again, much less the other cost. So it's, it's, it's sort of like a, um, it's just this, this compounding problem that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the worse the data gets. That's a simple example. But there's even other examples around, you know, the engineering process or, or even looking at HR where, oops, we got the decimal place in the wrong spot. So we paid the employee less, like like a lot less. And right. the employee gets upset. And and now the employee has that thing in their mind like, I don't know if I can trust these guys. Because somebody just put a decimal in the wrong place. That's right. Human error for sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so that's that's really with a with a with a proper data hygiene program in place. And don't get me wrong, everybody's busy. I do understand that. But you know, the, the, again, the, that's why you see these kinds of quotes where we're getting data wrong costs billions and trillions of dollars. I think even in your example in the quote that Forbes talked about, that's where that comes from. Okay. And I'm sure there's probably examples where if, say, Joe Schmo left the company, who do they even try to collect the money from? Right. If Jane Doe doesn't come in and take his place. That's exactly right. So then how do they collect the money and who ends up paying? Right. Right. That's right. And sometimes nobody does. Right. I mean, the bill just goes into cyberspace or wherever. And Mm -hmm. oftentimes companies don't stay on their accounts receivable that much. So then we've completely lost all those dollars. So. All that salesperson had to do was get the bill to right in the first place. So and if, I'll talk to those salespeople and tell yes. them that. I'm going to talk to our salesperson yes. after this meeting, actually. <laughs> right. It's really true. Yeah. So, okay. Well, with that said, what would you say is the best way for a business or a nonprofit to stay out in front of deteriorating data? Mm, that is a great question. So I think you really, let's take the nonprofit as an example. Let's take their donor database. That is vital to every single nonprofit. Now, some of them do more grants, but, but you know, the, the most important thing to do is, is having a really good solid system that is built such that, um, you know, it's easy to say mandate certain fields be filled in. So when a donor calls into a nonprofit, let's say, and says, yeah, I'd like to donate. And, you know, here's here's my credit card for $100 or whatever it is. Okay, great. So the person enters the information, clicks saves, process the credit card, and everything is done, right? That's how the core process should go. But then you look at the nuances of like, did we ask for certain information up front when the person called in to do the donation? Or a person decides to do it online. Did we ask for the right fields? Like, I get it that that's obvious and you don't want to ask somebody like too much information. You want to get their credit card, right? You want to get the donation processed, but there really is this like, like kind of a a balance between getting the transaction done, no different than the salesperson or even an accounting person who's doing the collections. There's a dunning process. It's called where you notify the customer by, by email, you send them a letter, da, 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 da. The accounting person needs to keep track of the data of what's happening there too. So mm-hmm. it's not just, you know, up front, it's on the tail end too. But but having systems that enforce gathering the right kind of data for sure is is vital. And I think most organizations understand that. You know, we've talked a lot about 2020 being the mm-hmm. year of SMBs for ERP. Right. That's a big reason why because Smaller organizations, mid-sized organizations are realizing, oh my gosh, we're putting all of our enterprise data in a spreadsheet and there's no way to enforce right. things like um, the mail to address is correct. I mean, you guys have probably experienced this online where, you know, you fill out an order and sometimes I put my address in, I'm in Lakewood, mm-hmm. but some, the postal service decides that it's Denver. Right. So then whoop, a little screen comes back and says, Oh, did you mean this address? Oh, sure. Click boom. That just saved a ton of time, right? Because I, the order goes out, it goes to some other wonky address. The product sits there. I get upset 
and then we don't receive the product and everything like that. So really having strong systems in place with kind of field level control, right? Again, that's that's sort of an obvious thing that, that you want to kind of take a look at um, and have those controls in place. But I would say, and, and we see some of our bigger clients that do what's called a master data management program, an MDM program, where they're looking at a customer in the CRM and a customer in order fulfillment and a customer in accounting, you know, lining up that record so that we have the full visibility of the, the customer. We're managing the customer data throughout the whole process versus mm -hmm. by system. You know, a lot of our organizations that we work with, they get that concept for sure. And they may even put in an NDM person, like if they can afford to have a guy or a gal. Right. I mean, even to the extent of data scientists, these are people that look at data and they try to figure out like, how can we make better decisions? What can we understand from the data that we have? Those programs are amazing, right? But what doesn't happen is a data hygiene program. Like, hey, I know what we should do today. Let's go clean our data. Right. You know, <laughs> Sounds fun. Yeah, it sounds fun. <laughs> Great. I think I should go sell some more products or I should go collect some more money or whatever first, right? But but it really is true that when you look at the expense of bad data, that you really, as a reactive kind of model, sometimes you got to put the right kind of program in place. You just kind of have to. It's sort of like these conditions where... You know, you start to see little indicators like, hmm, why is our day sales outstanding going up? Let's just look into the area. Let's find out what's going on. Gosh, we're sending a lot of invoices and we're sending them to the wrong addresses. We're not getting responses from people. Or, you know, there could be other indic indicators with inventory starting to go up. Why is our inventory going up? Why isn't anybody looking at what we have in the warehouse before they purchase, um, what, instead of purchasing new products, look in the warehouse, see right. what's there. Like you really have to start investigating from a business standpoint. Um, like the indicators are there of bad data hygiene. They're right there. It's sort of like, it's again, these dental analogies recently, like my dog, I have the like two most amazing dogs in the world. I'm sure everybody else does. That's cool. My dogs are cool. Yes. But one of them has had bad breath for like ever since we've had him. And so we're finally like, okay, that's it. Like what's going on? And take him to the vet and they're like, uh, he's got like corroded teeth. We're like, okay, we're like the worst dog parents ever. But <laughs> when we really got in, got the, the problem handled, now the, his breath is better. Fine. Right. So there are dog bad breath indicators. <laughs> when you think of data hygiene, think of bad dog breath. I don't know. But it's true that there are things that are happening in the business that when you start inspecting and going into this, just know if there's anything that you guys can get from listening to this and watching this, this, this discussion that we're having is know there's indicators of a bad data hygiene environment. And again, you'll start to spot those when you look at like days being delayed because people aren't getting back to you or our expenses are going up, expenditures are going up around inventory. Even our salespeople aren't as effective as we think they should be. How's the lead data that we're giving them? I want you to know that, that data hygiene is one of those things that can lead to these bad indicators in your business. But the most important thing is that something can be done about it, even if it's on a reactive kind of side where it's like, that's it. We have 50 custom fields on a, on a, in salesforce.com on a customer. And maybe it's too much because the data that's being entered into the 10 fields that we really need is wrong. You know, that, there might be some things that we have to change with our processes. But until you go in and really look at the why the data is the way it is, you don't know that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm a little bit, I can get pretty passionate actually about data. I didn't even realize it until we had this discussion because it can lead to so many bad things happening that there are simple solutions. There are systems that you can buy, but yeah. most likely the systems that most of our clients have are fine anyway. They can build in some validations, do some little logic checks and that kind of thing. And that super helps out for sure. But definitely putting it into people's hands as well and making people understand, okay, if you put, if you don't tell us the country of shipment salesperson up front, accounting doesn't know what to do with the taxation on the back end. And if we don't get the taxes right on the back end, the CFO goes to jail. Like that's, that's like the reality. And all of a sudden on the front end salesperson says, you know what? I'm going to get this right for you. Right. That kind of conversation changes everything for sure. Right. Well, it's like anything, like knowing what to look for, when to look for it, and how to look for it. You can just head everything off at the pass. That's right. right? Yeah. That's why we do these. That's why I love these conversations. 
I think we're coming to the end of our time. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add for our listeners today and um, just maybe kind of summarize a little bit about data hygiene? Yeah, yeah. I think like we talked about, data hygiene, if you look at it as a program, that's really the best way to do it, right? There's people, there's processes, there's tasks that need to get done. Um, doing it more proactively is, is always a good thing. There's a lot of pe- things that initiatives and things that people have to work on in a business. So totally understand. But when you see those indicators, know that data hygiene might be an underlying driver as to why we're, again, not closing deals or da- even sales deals are taking longer or just look across the whole business. Accounting isn't collecting as fast or manufacturing costs are going up or engineering is buying too much product or whatever it is. Um, know that data hygiene can be a really underlying reason why we have the bad dog breath or why our performance (laughs) as a business is is really struggling. And and again, when you feel that, go in and investigate for yourself. Use your own eyes to look in here and say, okay, these guys are saying everything's fine. I'm going to go look at some records. I'm going to go see here and trace it through. Um, And then the last thing that I would add, too, is, is, as I said, that when you have kind of a cross-process discussion and you talk to stakeholders who are involved up front and in the middle and the back end and they start talking about the problems that they're having, you'll see that the people that are kind of upstream, if you will, if data and other things Mm -hmm. trickle down um, and value kind of goes all the way through that whole chain, that if there's something up front that's not right, it's going to impact everybody else down the build, down, down, down the whole process to the point of trillions of dollars, like uh, Forbes said. So that's why yeah. we're talking about this. I appreciate that. So Well, thank you, Sean. Sure. Thanks for joining us yep. today. We really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's call. Uh, please let us know if you have any questions. We're here to answer any questions you might have and to help in any way we can. Uh, please join us for our next call scheduled for March 11th, the role of blockchain and ERP beyond cryptocurrency. In this next edition of the ERP Advisor, find out why we think 2020 is the year blockchain ERP tools will dominate and possibly even make sense for small and mid-sized businesses. Please go to our website, erpadvisorsgroup.com, for more details and to register. Thank you again, Sean. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Julia. ERP Advisors Group is one of the country's top independent enterprise software consulting firms, advising mid to large sized businesses on selecting and implementing business applications, including ERP, CRM, HCM, business intelligence, and other enterprise applications, which equate to millions of dollars in software deals each year across many industries. This has been the ERP Advisor. <laughs>